In this video, I'm going to decode basic neuroanatomy as it relates to MS. If you'd like to better understand the structures of the brain and spinal cord and how they can be impacted in the setting of multiple sclerosis, don't turn away because that starts right now. Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits, and it's my hope that through these videos, I can help you learn too. Today, I'm going to be discussing the structures of the brain and spinal cord, basic neuroanatomy. Let's jump in. The nervous system can be divided into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system involves the brain, the supercomputer that runs the body, the optic nerves that run your eyeballs, and the spinal cord that connects your brain to the rest of your body and back up. Those structures are considered part of the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system involves everything else. In other words, all the nerves that come off the spinal cord, the neuromuscular junction between the nerve and the muscle, and the actual muscle itself. All of that is part of the peripheral nervous system. Now, multiple sclerosis impacts the central nervous system only brain, optic nerves, and spinal cord. And so that will be the focus of today's discussion. As it relates to the brain, we have the cortex or the surface of the brain. We have the structures deep to the cortex. We have the brain stem, and we're gonna be walking through each one of those separately. And then we'll get to the spinal cord. Now, as it relates to cortex, the word cortex in Greek means bark, which makes sense because the cortex covers the surface of the brain. And it's really the computer or the portion of the brain where we do thinking, where we actually compute math and process thoughts, etc. We divide the cortical areas up into lobes. Here on the screen in red, you see the frontal lobe. Now the frontal lobe has several different functions, but the two functions that I would like to point out, one is motor function. And I used to teach students and residents, think about the motor being in the front of an American car. Now you see on the picture, I've labeled M for the motor strip. And that's actually where all of the encoding occurs to tell your arm to move or your leg to move. That's actually where that portion of your brain is allocated. The other thing that I want us to keep in mind as it relates to the frontal lobe is executive functioning or complex thinking. Things like um, keeping a list in your head, doing math in your head, multitasking, etc. And executive functioning is something which is very commonly impacted in the setting of MS. We now turn our attention to the purple or the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe has a major function of helping us better understand space and sensory function. So if you see where I've listed uh, S, 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 I'm marking out the sensory strip. And that's the portion of the brain where you encode sensation. So when someone touches your hand and you can feel you're being touched, a signal is going from your hand up the nerve, up the spinal cord to that portion of your parietal lobe telling you, hey, my hand is being touched. The parietal lobe is also involved in helping us understand orientation in space. So for example, even with my eyes closed, I know that my hand's open and I know it's right there. I can even with my eyes closed, touch my thumb or my finger. I'm not using vision to guide my hand. I'm using something called proprioception, which is a feature of that area of the parietal lobe. Next, we turn our attention to the orange section or the temporal lobe. And the temporal lobe has several different functions, but I wanna highlight its use in language, specifically in understanding language. And that W that you see there is marking out an area of the brain where we receive language. That's housed in the temporal lobe. Lastly, I like to point out the green section or the occipital lobe. And that's the primary visual cortex. In other words, all the info from our eyes eventually gets filtered back to that area of the brain where we can process and recognize images. And all of these different parts of the brain, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe are all part of the cortex. Now it bears mentioning that multiple sclerosis lesions can affect the cortex. You can have cortical lesions. And it's important to keep in mind, however, that the traditional MRI machine can't see cortical lesions very well. Whereas we can see white matter lesions really easily. They light up bright white 
the same lesion in the cortex is almost near invisible on the MRI, and that's because of the way MRI takes images. If you did a pathology section where you sliced the brain up and stained it, you would see that the cortex is riddled with lesions in MS. This is important because for a long time, neurologists forgot that the cortex was involved in MS, but it most certainly is. Another feature that we want to keep in mind as it relates to the cortex is cortical atrophy. All brains over the age of 18 are pre-programmed to shrink a little every year. But in the setting of untreated MS, they can shrink really, really fast. And the cortex is an area where we can see a lot of brain shrinkage. Having briefly discussed the cortex, I now turn our attention to just under the cortex, to what I call subcortical tissues. And one of the primary things that we think about is all the white matter. The white matter are really a bunch of wires that connect one portion of the cortex to another portion of the cortex. So there's a connection there. And those so-called wires are myelinated. They're coated in a fatty substance called myelin, which really functions the way that a plastic coating functions on a real wire. It helps conduct electricity much faster. Now what I'm showing you in this image is the corpus callosum. To orient you, we're looking at a real brain, we're looking down on top of the brain, and we're pulling apart the lobes. And what you see is this giant white matter structure called the corpus callosum, and you can literally see the wires that connect the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. Now, multiple sclerosis can most certainly affect white matter. In fact, um, there's a, a predilection for white matter lesions. And when you're reading MRI reports or reading other things online or talking to a neurologist, they may comment on cortical lesions juxtacortical lesions, which really references the junction between the gray matter and the white matter, right where they match up, and then periventricular white matter lesions. Our discussion wouldn't be complete if I didn't talk about the optic nerves. And here you can see a cartoon of the optic nerves. This is basically the wire, if you will, that connects your eyeball to your brain. And it's very commonly affected in the setting of MS. Many of you are familiar with or may have experienced optic neuritis. This is where that nerve becomes inflamed and information, visual information, can no longer pass through the eye back to the brain. And as a result, you can't see very well. Optic neuritis oftentimes involves pain with eye movements because as that nerve swells, it causes pressure. And when you move your eye left or right or up and down, it's literally tugging on the nerve and it can hurt like the dickens. I also wanted to cover some deep structures which are also considered subcortical tissues. And these are deep gray matter structures, basically in the center of the brain. The first one that I wanted to highlight is called the thalamus. And the thalamus is a sensory relay. So every th single sensation, with the exception of smell, runs through the thalamus. So for example, when you see something, that visual information goes tracking through to the thalamus and then out to wherever it needs to go. Same thing with taste, same thing with hearing. So Thalamic lesions, which can occur in MS, can massively impact sensation, and they can lead to things like a numb leg or a numb arm or a burning sensation. That's not the only way that you can develop numbness in MS, but it's one of the ways. The next structure that I'm showing you here is just below the thalamus, and it's called the hypothalamus because it's found just below the thalamus. The hypothalamus is kind of the master gland and it's really responsible for several different autonomic functions, including temperature regulation. Rarely, we will see someone with MS who has a super, super low basal uh, temperature. And when we get an MRI, we may find that they have a lesion of the hypothalamus. Another important structure deep in the brain is called the basal ganglia. And here you see a cartoon of the various parts of the basal ganglia, and you can see how it's deep inside the brain. The basal ganglia is really involved in smoothing out fine motor movements. And so it makes you not move like a robot. It allows for very smooth movements. And I always think of, for example, a ballerina as having a really developed basal ganglia in his or her ability to move eloquently. Damage to the basal ganglia in any condition, including MS, can cause difficulty with motor movements. The last subcortical structure that I want to discuss is the limbic system. And here's a cartoon of all the various structures of the limbic system. This is again a structure deep inside the brain, and it's really involved in emotion and memory.
And so you may notice sometimes that a smell brings back a particular memory that's encoded deep in the limbic system. We now turn our attention to the base of the brain, a structure that we call the brain stem. This is the oldest portion of the brain evolutionarily, and it encodes a lot of really critical functions. The brain stem houses all the cranial nerve nuclei. So there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves that literally run the face. Sensation, movement, eye movement, swallowing, taste, tongue movement, etc. And all those cranial nerves are driven, if you will, by nuclei inside the brain stem. Think of a nucleus as like an engine. And so we divide the brain stem into several different parts. Here we're highlighting the midbrain. And so you can see the midbrain circled in red. And there are two cranial nerve nuclei here. Um, I'm not gonna go over them with you. It's not something that I want you to memorize, um, but simply know that they're involved in moving your eyeballs. So those cranial nerve nuclei run nerves that then make your eyeballs move in certain directions. Here, I highlight the structure right below the midbrain. This is the pons. And the pons is another portion of the brain stem. And it has several different cranial nerve nuclei. And these are involved in lots of different functions, including, again, eye movements, as well as some control over your face and taste. Then we move down to the, ba the very base of the brain, a structure called the medulla. And the medulla, again, has several important cranial nerve nuclei. And these encode a lot of things, for example, swallowing, and also the way that you move your tongue. MS lesions to any part of the brainstem whether that be the midbrain, pons, or medulla, generally don't go unnoticed. And you can develop what we call a brainstem syndrome, where you might have a droopy face, or you might have a numb face, or your eyes might not move evenly, and one eye is stuck out over here, or one eye doesn't go up and down, or you lose taste, or you have difficulty with your tongue, or you have difficulty swallowing. And these are all structures controlled by the brain stem. The last brain stem structure that I like to review is circled here in the back of the brain, the cerebellum. Cerebellum is Greek for little brain, and because that's kind of what it looks like. And like the basal ganglia, the cerebellum helps smoothing out motor movements and helping us with coordination and with balance. Lesions to the cerebellum can cause us to stumble and walk like we're drunk, or to be unsteady with our hand movements, or incoordinated. So here we've had a lightning fast review of some basic neuroanatomy of the brain, the cortex, the bark of the brain, where we do the thinking. And this is divided into lobes, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. We then move deep into the brain where we think about the white matter, all the wires that are connecting those various portions of the cortex. We think about the deep brain structures, the basal ganglia helping with movement, the limbic system involved in memory and emotion. We think about the thalamus, which is a major sensory relay, and the hypothalamus, which is like the master gland and controls things like temperature. We think about the optic nerves, the nerves that literally run the vision coming into the eyeballs and then back to the back of the brain. And lastly, we think about the brain stem, made up of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla, which all house all those different cranial nerves that control your face. And lastly, the cerebellum, the little brain, which helps with coordinated movements and balance. There's a lot going on. I'm now gonna shift our attention away from the supercomputer and I wanna cover the superhighway, the spinal cord. And so here's a cartoon of the spinal cord. The way the spinal cord is laid out, sensory information from the body goes up the dorsal portion of the spinal cord, so the part close to our back and damage along the dorsum of the spinal cord is gonna cause numbness and tingling at a level below it. It also sends motor information from the brain down, and that happens on the ventral, or the, the front surface of the spinal cord. Damage along the front surface of the spinal cord is gonna cause weakness. The other function of the spinal cord is the down there, is bowel, bladder, and sexual function. Really think of the spinal cord as a highway that connects everything the brain is doing sending info down and everything the brain is receiving information coming up. This has been a very simplified version of neuroanatomy. Neuroanatomy is a super complex field and I simply wanted to give you some orientation to the major structures and how they may play out in the setting of multiple sclerosis. If you're curious and would like more information about specifics, leave comments down in the section below about areas that you would like to learn more about.
Once again, my name's Aaron Boster, and thank you very much for learning about MS with me. And I look forward to chatting with you on a future video or on a live stream, or if I see you in clinic. And until then, take care.